All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Planning Commission meeting. Today's date is November 9th, 2022, and the time is 9.30 a.m. Sorry, I'm having some lighting challenges here. All right. So today's um, meeting is completely remote via Zoom. There are a couple of different ways to participate in today's meeting. If your computer is equipped with a microphone, it is recommended that you participate via the Planning Commission Zoom link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, if your computer is not equipped with a microphone, you may provide comment by telephone. To call in, the number is 669-900-6833. And when prompted, you want to enter collaboration code 814 one five two eight zero two nine, and this information again is posted on the planning department's website on the public hearing page. So during key points in today's meeting, time will be provided for members of the public to provide their testimony. Speakers will be muted until called on to speak. I will ask participants who wish to provide testimony to either remotely raise your hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link or if by calling in by telephone, by remotely raising your hand by pressing star nine on your telephone. I will call in, I will call on participants by either your name or the last four digits of your telephone number. If you are participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says unmute. Please accept the pop-up, state your name for the record and provide your testimony. If calling in via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six. If at any time you have difficulty connecting to today's meeting via the Zoom link or calling in via telephone, we do have support staff with us here today, Michael Lamb. Please contact him via email. He's checking it periodically throughout the meeting and it is michael.lam, that's L-A-M, at santacruzcounty.us. All right, so those are the instructions to participate in the meeting. I will now turn it over to our Planning Commission Chair, Tim Gordon, good morning. Good morning, Jocelyn. Thank you for that great intro. Um, good morning to everyone who's here. Welcome to the hearing of the Santa Cruz Planning Commission on November 9th, 2022. It's 9.34 and call this meeting to order at this time. Ms. Drake, can we please have a roll call? Yes. Commissioner Dan? Here. Commissioner Shepard? Here. Commissioner Violante? Here. And Chair Gordon. Here. And I'll note that uh, Commissioner Lazenby is out today. Wonderful, thank you. Um, moving right along, agenda item number two, additions and corrections to the agenda. Do we have any today, Ms. Drake? Uh, no, there are none. Okay, great. On to item three, do any uh, declaration of ex parte communications, do any commissioners have any ex parte communications they'd like to declare? Okay, great, thank you. Next agenda item is agenda four, oral communications. This is the time of the hearing where members of the public have the opportunity to speak on items that are not on the agenda today. Um, Ms. Drake, do we have any members that would like to speak at this time? I do see a hand raised. Um, so if we could have two minutes, please, on the timer. Um, members of the public will have two minutes to speak on, at this time on items that are not on the agenda. And I'm seeing the caller with the last four digits, 2915. Good morning. Please state your name for the record. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Becky. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I want to bring to the commission's attention two very important items uh, happening in the community that affect our um, the whole of the county, really. The first is that the process for approving fire code in the county has changed. Originally, uh, each fire district reviewed the fire code and amended it to suit their particular boundaries. That is not happening this year. Instead, it is all going to be going to the County Board of Supervisors, I believe, November 14th as the Santa Cruz County Fire Code. 
it conforms with the state fire code, but also there are things that are more strict than the county, than the state's fire code. It is difficult to really determine that because there is no strikeout underlying version of it. And in fact, uh, Central Fire Protection District Board and the County Fire Advisory, um, County Fire Department Advisory Commissioners have not even seen this. There is, uh, it, it concerns me that these people are being shut out completely and that it will come before the County Board of Supervisors with really no oversight or input from the fire agencies and the fire commission itself. So um, I, I wanna make that clear and hope that you will review that document when it comes up at the fire, at the Board of Supervisors meeting on November 14th. The second very critical issue is the Pure Water SoCal project being built right now by SoCal Creek Water District will inject treated sewage water into the aquifer. The final document for public review regarding that is now open for public comment through December 8th. There will be a virtual public hearing December 1st at 5.30. It's difficult to find the information about that hearing on the SoCal Creek Water District website, but this is for the public hearing of the Title 22 engineering report. Thank you, will, Becky. All right, I hope people will participate. Thank you. All right, do we have any other members of the public who wish to make a comment on any subject that is not covered on today's agenda? If so, please raise your hand. And again, to raise your hand if you're calling in is star nine. We lose Jocelyn. Uh, looks like we might have lost her. Um. All right, let's see. Mike, are you on by chance? Yeah, I'm here, Tim. All right, cool. I think we, looks like we lost Jocelyn. So I think we can move on if you don't mind helping me out. Um, it doesn't look like there are any other hands raised for the, um, uh, for item four oral communication. So we can go ahead and close the public comment at this time and move on to a consent agenda item. Uh, right now we have our favorite resolution, AB 361. And uh, that is the only thing on the consent agenda item. So if there are any commissioners who'd like to discuss or make a motion on this, I think it'd be appropriate. I'll move approval. Thank you, Commissioner Dan. A second. And Commissioner Violante, appreciate the second. Okay, with that, we can move on to a vote. Um, as a reminder, we're doing roll call votes on everything while remote. Um, Mr. Lamb, are you able to help us track that? Michael, are you there still? Maybe can Justin yeah. do that then? I see that Mr. Machado is available for yeah. that. <laughs> and, 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 and Mr. Machado, do we need to take oral comment on the consent agenda at all, or do we take it as part of our oral communications? Um. Usually we have oral comment on the consent agenda. Excellent. Because okay. I see we do have a hand raised, so but I don't uh, know if we have the ability to promote them because without just without uh, Mr. Lamb, which means we might need to take a small recess until we have either Jocelyn or Michael back. I think we can still, let's see if I have access. I think we can, uh, so Chair, if you want to take a, a short recess. Oh, sorry. 
Actually, yeah, I, I just I got off. If we could, oh, Michael's back. Okay, Michael's great. back. Michael. I'm sorry, uh, Jocelyn just called me um, and she asked if we can take a quick recess to get her reconnected. I think her network uh, failed, but she's at the county building. So she's back in her email. I think she should be joining us again soon. Um, Michael, and of yes. course, this is chair, if I could just make a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to just skip ahead um, if we have one of the presenters here to just get into the agenda so that, you know, because we don't have to take votes on the study session, there are not action items. So if we could just hear the, these presentations, we can, you know, get some work done. Yeah, I think everyone who is presenting is, is with us. Um, I don't have permissions to update or um, to promote folks. Uh, I believe Jocelyn did that before she left because I can see Mr. Reed is with us, Mr. Dallas is with us, and so I believe yeah. we actually have our presenters already on and they may be able to begin, Mr. Machado, and if, I don't know if your team is also part of that, but I believe we have our presenters, the staff, with us for that item. <clears throat> I think Ms. Gann's suggestion would be a good one. Can we start with item seven? Yeah, I think if that works for everybody, we can move pass item five and six, come back to those at the end um, for um, motions and voting, and just go into study session uh, item number seven. Um, this is the study session report to the Planning Commission on the 2023 through 25 County Operational Plan process, a Santa Cruz like me, and Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. Um, believe that we have Mr. Detlefs presenting today, if I'm not mistaken. And yes, good morning. morning. How are you, sir? I'm good, thank you. Great. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. All right, can you see the presentation? Yes, sir. All right, perfect. Well, again, my name is Peter Detlefs. I'm a principal analyst with the County Administrative Office. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with the Planning Commission today. We would like to update you uh, and get input on several initi initiatives at the County Administrative Office. Um, the first being the 2023-25 operational plan. The second, uh, a Santa Cruz like me, it's a project plan. Okay. I was telling you, you should look into the county a bit. Mr. Lamb, I know. you yeah. are unmuted. Um, maybe Michael? one day. I just... Always. Michael. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Um, a Santa Cruz like me, it's a project centered around uh, proportionate representation. And third, Dave Reed, uh, the OR3 director, will be presenting on the climate action adaptation plan. So um, the Santa Cruz County strategic plan for 2018 to 2024 was approved by the Board of Supervisors in June 2018. It includes a vision, which is an aspirational statement of the kind of community we want to be, a mission, why we exist as an organization, and values, how we show up to serve. The operational plan is how the county intends to fulfill the mission and achieve the vision from the strategic plan. It's refreshed every two years and updated biannually. It outlines the county's major activities accountable through specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, time-bound, inclusive and equitable objectives, also known as SMARTY. In development of the first two operational plans, objectives were presented to the commissions and other stakeholders only after um, written by the departments. Feedback from the Board of Supervisors and the commissions included that engaging earlier in the process would lead to better objectives. So for the 2023-25 operational plan, the county is focused on continuing to hold major activities accountable to measurable results, working with community partners to make sure their voices are reflected in the plan, validation from the people closest to a problem in designing its solution, and continue to disaggregate data to uncover hyper-local trends and gaps in service. So at this point, we'd like to pause and, and receive input from commissioners. Um, you can also provide written input through the survey link that is included in the staff report. I was hoping to paste it into the chat here, but I'm not sure that I have that. Um, and so 
maybe we can just go ahead and get started here. So within the purview of the Planning Commission, please consider you know, these three questions and we'll go after them one by one here. So let's start with the first one of, you know, what one issue if addressed would um, have the biggest um, positive impact for county residents? You can take feedback now if you prefer to do it through, you know, the, uh, their survey, you know, we can leave that up to you. I'll look to you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, definitely. So just to be clear, we can, this is the interactive, right? We can answer this, this now. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm here to okay. take notes and provide feedback, yeah. but we also have that survey as well if yeah. you prefer to, you know, respond offline. Yeah, this is, a. this is, well, I'd be happy to uh, do the survey. I looked at it also before we um, started, but it, um, you know, seemed like it, it would be more easily finalized once we had some more information. So. Um, I'll do that right after, um, but you know I think there's a lot of a lot of things that can be you know really positive uh, impact for our county residents. And um, man, I, I would say probably one of that just comes top of mind uh, amongst a long list of things you know that we're always all working on is you know uh, maybe transportation, um, public transportation, and more bikeable kind of walkable areas. It would go a long way. Any other commissioners want to chime in? Sure, I'm happy to chime in. I mean, obviously, I think one of the biggest things that we are addressing as a county and the planning commission has purview over, and obviously, the sustainability update, and then what we're doing next year. Obviously, it's the housing element because the access to affordable housing uh, in Santa Cruz County has the biggest impact on people's ability to to reside here in an equitable fashion. And I think that goes to what you're talking. I think your next presentation kind of incorporated to this is the Santa Cruz like me. If people can't live here and have affordable housing and equitable incomes and access to things, it, it, it precludes them from having the ability to then participate in their government. If you can't earn a living wage, then it, you don't have the time to volunteer to be part of a commission. You, you don't have the ability to participate in meetings during the day or the evening because you're working both of those times. And so the planning commission comes into the role that they end up playing has to do with the way we build um, the structure under which people can afford to live here. Um, and that means building uh, the way we create um, access to housing is one of the biggest ways that the planning commission, in my opinion, uh, comes into play in, in terms of that. Great. All right, thank you. All right, well, we can move on to the next question here. Of, um, what are two major projects? Well, maybe we've already answered this, Allison, right? What are two major projects anticipated within the next two years? So the sustainability plan and the housing element for sure. Um, anything else that you'd like to bring up? Uh, I'd like to answer the first one. I, oh, I'm sorry, Rick. Yeah. Commissioner Shepard. I'm sorry, I was muting myself while I was talking on and on, sorry. <laughs> uh, resource management, in other words, I'm constantly struck that we look at one goal, like more affordable housing, ignoring at the same time do what resources are necessary to support that. So um, resource management and carrying capacity. It's, we can't have one without the other. So balancing our needs in regards to the resources that are available um, is a big concern and was a big concern during looking at the general plan changes and the sustainability update, you know, we can build so much housing, but we need to make sure we have the water and we are not adding so much congestion. And on the other hand, we need the housing, but I mean, they've all got to be looked at together. So overall planning uh, of resource management is very important and integration of resource management uh, in departments is important. Okay. Personally, I think the state could do a thousand percent better job of that too. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Uh, uh, especially here in the unincorporated area and the more rural areas, we're very limited by resource uh, availability. So it's no sense planning for increased density if you have out on the water and the roads and the fire safety and so on. 
that's what I meant. Okay. All right, so um, Allison already mentioned two of the major projects over the next two years. Does anyone want to weigh in on um, any further activities? What, what do you mean by what are the major projects? So, you know, projects that are you foresee coming through um, the Planning Commission um, that you will vote upon that you can see would have an impact. Um, Rachel, you're breaking up badly. Right. Yeah, I think there's some kind of connection issue. It kind of sounds like somebody's speaker's too close to their microphone. Peter, try to mute and let's see if it goes away. I think it's come from Peter's machine. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's uh, Peter, you're... So what I was... So yeah, I don't want to pause. <laughs> so let's just get through this. But to um, answer Peter's question, you know, planning commissioners usually don't have a sense of what projects are coming forward because that's not our role. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, if, like me and Allison were staff of a board member, we do have kind of a insideritis knowledge of things coming forward. So I, I don't know that that's like the best question for us, but since I, I do know of some projects that are really important coming forward, obviously the rail trail segments that are um, under construction right now in the city and then the segments that will be constructed in Live Oak and on the North Coast are vitally important. And then there's several infrastructure projects going on in the North Coast that are also uh, really important for access to uh, public open space. I would agree if if you're not if you're not part of the county infrastructure, um, we only see projects when they arrive in our agenda. So I don't know that we can answer that very well. Good, thank you. Okay, um, and then the last is if there's any data that you use or you wish you had to know if county programs are making um, anyone better off. Well, do you want to redefine what you mean by better off? Is that that's the whole thing that you're addressing? You have right, you have like a whole bunch of points of what you mean, right? Uh -huh. I mean, I think Renee's asking a great question, and this is really just almost like too broad to even answer because, you know, everyone would define better off in different ways. Is there right. some plan? Is it part of the plan to define that? Well, I mean, that's, I mean, each program like should produce outcomes and each program should define better off tailored to what that program is. So, I mean, I think the, one of the things I would say is that and this really has nothing to do with the planning commission. So, but I'll just say it anyway, um, because the planning commission doesn't deal with programs except really like housing issues. Um, so, but we get data every year from, um, you know, the growth goal, which is, you know, gives us a lot of information about you know, how many building permits were um, pulled, how many ADUs are constructed, how much affordable housing has been constructed. So I feel like in the housing area, we do get pretty good data. Um, I don't know if that, you know, we have any sense or role in, um, you know, in evaluating whether people are better off, but I think like what you're speaking to are more of the um, health and human services programs that the county administers on behalf of the state largely, um, then each program should have outcomes that they're working towards. And, you know, I would say that, um, we could do better in those areas because most of the times those outcomes tell us how many people are served and in the way that they were served. But what's lacking is knowing um, if it has moved the needle in one dire direction or the other. So that's that's the um, general broad input I would give um, for a huge, I mean, the county industries, I don't know, probably hundreds, like over a hundred, you know, dozens and dozens at least of specific programs to serve specific populations. So, um, so, but yeah, but I think that the county is going in a very good direction on this and the operational plan is, is part of that. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think specifically here, right? I mean, we're we're looking to the planning department to develop objectives for the operational plan, right? That are, you know, specifically related to planning, and that those will be measurable objectives. Um, and we're just looking at, you know, what is that data that would be needed in order to, um, you know, measure whether or not we've been successful. So. Um, yeah. And on that, I'd just say, I think the planning department actually does a real good job and maybe it's a, a product of the fact that, you know, you're dealing with like real numbers here. Like, did this person get a building permit? Did their environmental health clearance, you know, you know, resolve in a positive way? And, uh, you know, and Dave, um, you know, can speak to this, like, you know, he, we set up a dashboard for fire survivors so we can actually track like, you know, where people are in the process. So I actually think, in some ways, planning um, is a little bit ahead of the curve than um, other departments, and so because we can access that data, that's helpful for us to understand where we're going as far as building housing or rebuilding um, after the fire. So th that's my that would be my my feedback at this point. Yeah, and I might add to that um, a little bit that. I think that, you know, metrics is really important. So you can not just, you know, see where you're at, but figure out how to do it better and faster and, you know, continue to, to progress. And we do have some metrics, but there could be more like, um, you know, timeline between permit and building issuance is good, but why is it, why is it the duration that it is? Why isn't it faster? And not just like from the county perspective, like, Maybe the maybe there was 15 submittals for some reason because the applicant had challenges, or maybe there was financial challenges or something. But if there's a way to get like some more information as to like not just if projects are happening, but maybe the why can help us kind of figure out um, how to help improve the process overall. So, uh, Mr. Machado. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, chime in real quick on some of the comments that you you all are making. You know, in terms of uh, infrastructure, transportation, the housing needs, and um, I think you know, putting those together, uh, one of the things that comes to mind in terms of projects and data uh, is is as we go forward with the sustainability update, and which includes a circulation element. Um, next steps uh, will be a update to our impact fee program, our transportation impact fee program, which links the housing to the needed transportation elements. Uh, and there's a lot of good data in there that will assist in that. And so I just wanted to uh, put that out there because you know that type of an objective would be helpful to meet the needs and goals that you all talk about regularly. So I just wanted to put that out there for, for Peter's ears to hear that that's a real uh, straightforward uh, project that ties what you all do daily. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, great. Yeah, and kind of synthesizing like Commissioner Dan and, and Chair Gordon's comments, I think if you're specifically talking about things within the purview of the planning commission and therefore the planning department's operational goals and you know, strategic planning, you know, I think that they're going the right direction. I mean, and it becomes synthesizing kind of the this many permits issued to the permit took this, you know, efficiency. So why, why did the permit take six months versus three months and how much of that was in the planning department's time the plan, permit was in the planning department's hands. And I know that they're actually doing that. I know that the planning department's doing those types of things. And so the question of, is anybody better off? For the planning department, that question becomes to Tim's point, which is how quickly did someone get their permit and how much of it was the county's component versus I know we're working on not having resubmittals due to inconsistency of communication or things like that. And so the, the things that are within the county's control um, on being able to better uh, efficiently serve the public. And so those are the type of metrics the planning department for their part of the operational plan. Because to Rachel's point, um, those are the parts that are in our control versus if we're gonna talk programmatic goals of general county operational plan is a whole different thing if we're gonna talk. But I think keeping it to this like planning framework um just saying this many were given is not quite enough of a metric versus how and why and the, the timeline and ensuring so that we can create change based on that um, is important um the things that are within our control um to be better and i think that i think rachel's point is right that we we do get a lot of data in terms of like how many units of housing are built 
and but there's also I think a component of programmatically like we like the planning commission doesn't deal with like programmatically like how many unhoused people are you know do we serve through things that don't come to the planning commission but that is someone being better off right um and so I think that those things do get served through the planning department though right those are served through the housing division and so I think that if you wanted to talk about data that could be provided a little bit expanding beyond um the, the planning commission but talking about planning data those are programmatic things that you can talk about um and, and know that the, the community is better off um that the planning commission doesn't see that data but it could be incorporated to talk about the way that the planning department is serving the community in a, in a housing way or in a planning way in a transportation way um so those are things that the, the planning commission doesn't see but that does the planning department because I, I i can't decide Mr. Dallas, if you'd like us to talk about the planning department or things within the planning commission's purview right now. <laughs> and so I'm trying to answer a little bit of both um, on what you, how we can best help you in, in what you'd like us to talk about today. Um, and so I'm trying to kind of straddle both sides. <laughs> yeah, I think, Allison, you're on the right track, right? I mean, it does get a little bit blurred between the planning department and the commission for sure, right? I mean, and, and the goal here is to help the commission provide some feedback to the planning department, you know, on how we can better serve the community right through these objectives and how we spend. Yeah, because I guess my point is there's a lot that the planning department does that doesn't come before the commission. And so I just I don't know if I want if you want me to answer things that the commission needs from the department or things the commission thinks the department can do better <laughs> in terms of serving the community. And so I just um yeah. I mean, ultimately, it could be both, right? I mean, we're we're here today to present to you that this is this is coming, right? So the ops plan is coming, and and that staff is working on objectives here now that will be, you know, heading toward the the board of supervisors, you know, um, in the spring summer um, with the proposed budget. And so we don't want you to be caught off guard that those are moving ahead and have not had a chance to comment. Yeah, I, I think that I think the biggest overarching thing that I would just say when it comes to um, these types of goals is I think that they need to be useful data in order for us to enact change. So not just that we did something, check the box. That is not a, for me, something that becomes a useful way to make these strategic plans or these objectives. Um, it needs to be something where we can take that data and then use it for a purpose to be more efficient, to, to know that a program needs tweaking, um, because a check the box becomes a, 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 it's a checklist. It's not a tool. And I would hope that it becomes a tool that we can use to enact uh, it changed. Um, let's see what Ms. Ms. Dan has comments. I think I've talked enough for a bit. No, I, I think those are really great comments. I was just going to add one more nuance, and I think that this is maybe somewhat unique to the planning department when you're working with uh, applicants, um, and that in order for you to make a decision, you're relying on information from the applicant in order to process that permit. So I think, you know, just to, if one of the, let's just say one of the objectives would be, you know, that we um, reduce our, our permit time, issu issuance time by three months or something like that, or whatever it is. Um, it's a, it's kind of uh, complicated to do that. It's because, you know, you can do all that you can do on your end, but say you're waiting on a biotic report from so-and-so applicant and that biotic report is taking a really long time because they can't hire the consultant or maybe they submit it to you, but it's incomplete. So you have to send it back with comments and then you have to wait again. So um, so I'm just saying it, it might make your job harder, <laughs> um, you know, those types of objectives because, um, you know, on the face of it, it may seem, well, that's simple. Like we just need to change some processes and we can make things move faster. And I think that that, that could be largely correct, but at the same time, there's, things that are outside of your control that may look like you're taking a long time to do something that's actually something else that's going on that's out of your control. So I'm sure you you know this though, Peter. <laughs> Absolutely. But I think it's a, a point worth noting for sure, Rachel, or Commissioner Dan, sorry. <laughs> you can call me Rachel. <laughs> All right, great. Um, anything further on this before we move on to a Santa Cruz like me? Okay. 
All right. So um, last year, after receiving the 2020 census data, the County Administrative Office um, partnered with Santa Cruz Community Ventures to gain a better understanding of the makeup of the county's representative bodies, right? So a survey went out to county commissions, boards, and advisory bodies. Um, and the findings of that survey were presented in a report um, called Santa Cruz Like Me, the value of representation representational government. So there have been a couple of items that have gone to the Board of Supervisors um, and this report has gone to them uh, previously. So we're just going to briefly share today just some of the key findings in that report. Um, and, you know, Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz Like Me survey was, you know, the first time the county viewed data on boards and commissions demographic composition. You know, given the voluntary nature of the survey and that it was only provided to currently appointed members and, you know, we only received a response rate of about 50%. Um, it did not provide a clear comparison of the composition of applicants versus those being appointed. So, you know, we recognize there's some um, limitations in the data, but it's a, it's a starting point. Um, but we want to, you know, we, we recognize this as a first step toward data-driven efforts to align um, with the strategic plan goals of toward representation and um, that is culturally diverse and economically inclusive. So some of the key findings addressed in the report, um, you know, reflect underrepresentation of South County residents um, and, a, and a critical underrepresentation of renters, right? So mostly homeowners um, that you see that participate on commissions. Um, additionally, you know, there's an underrepresentation based on race and age. Um, so, you know, um, and then finally, you know, we're also seeing an overrepresentation of college graduates, particularly those people with advanced degrees. And so, um, sorry, I'm too fast there. So, you know, what's being done to better align representation on the commissions with county census data. So we've already begun creating a committee to review variances and propose solutions. We're updating the applications for these boards and commissions um, to, to collect voluntary and confidential demographic data and also improving the onboarding process for appointees, right? So the, um, the Santa Cruz Like Me Committee began meeting monthly in September of this year to identify goals and strategies, outreach to the community, track and measure outcomes, and assess the impacts of, of the work. So again, today here, we're just, you know, looking to receive a little input. Um, again, it can be done through the survey, doesn't need to be done here, but just running through these questions quickly, you know, you know what one change if implemented, if implemented would move us toward commissions that are representative and inclusive of our diverse community? I mean, if you have any thoughts here. Could I just ask a quick question? Sure. Um, in the explanation that you just gave, the part you said about variances, I didn't quite understand that. Um, about variances? Uh, Did you mean variances of, to me, uh, variance in a pl planning regard means something very specific, but I think you were talking about something else. I think it's the variances of who's serving on the community. On the, oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Right? Got it. Got it. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, I can jump in. I don't have a, an answer for this. And, uh, but something we can definitely think about more. Um, is there any type of outreach or plans in place that the county's already started or thought about on how to, you know, align these a little bit better? We're in the process of that, right? And yeah. how, do we, how do we outreach better to whole communities that we don't typically, you know, engage with? And, and then, and lowering the barriers to that application process, right? So that, you know, there aren't questions on the application that might deter somebody, somebody from responding if it's not necessarily needed to serve on the commission, right? So since we talked about education, right? Is it required that you have a college education, right? And why are we asking that if it's not, right? So those kinds of things that we're looking at. Gotcha. 
Well, for the planning commission, usually we're appointed by the supervisor. So it's a little different than some of these other commissions you're talking about. Well, well actually that's a really good question, Renee. Um, Peter, can you just briefly for the other commissioners who aren't familiar with this, um, talk about the most commissions are appointed by a supervisor and then there's some at large that are appointed by the board, but could, in case I'm mistaken about which commissions are included in the study, could you just briefly talk about that? And then could you also talk about what the definition of South County is so we can have a geographic kind of boundary in mind of what you're talking about here? I mean, does it include Aptos or, or not? Both good questions, right? Um, what is that definition of South County? It, it tends to vary on who you speak to. Um, I'm not 100% sure what that, in this situation, what that definition is, but I'm, I'm assuming it is south of Aptos. Um, and you're correct, right? I mean, a number of these commissions are appointed, right? But I think it, it doesn't change the conversation that we need to have is how do we get other people engaged in the process and, and create a more. Yes, absolutely, 100%, exactly. Um, I would just say though, like if you're, if you have a supervisor like our district, we represent the North Coast and Santa Cruz, the city of Santa Cruz, most commissions, you appoint people in your district. So, you know, we don't appoint folks from South County because they're not in our district. So we have two spots on the Commission on the Environment. Those two spots are gonna be people from our district and you know, Supervisor Bruce McPherson is in the same boat. Um, Supervisor Koenig is also in the same boat. So I think that it's, um, it's an extremely important conversation to have. I think we need better representation on our commissions. We need more younger people. Um, we need renters. We need a diversity of educational background. Um, I think it's important though to understand the data if we understand how um, these commissions are appointed so that we understand really what we're talking about here and, and that will help us um, improve those uh, metrics. Well, and to Commissioner Dan's point about how we define South County, I mean, if, if we're not, I, I'm very curious about where we define that line because I mean, if because they, of many of these positions are not only appointed by the Board of Supervisors, but often they are designed to represent the district. I mean, for example, the Planning Commission has one person from each district. I mean, if you're not including, say, Aptos, the, the only district that is going to be South County is going to be one of five. Um, I mean, we have the ability to represent, our, our district does extend beyond Aptos, but um, the, the, and we do make an extreme effort in the, the second district to appoint people from Watsonville and from the even farthest part of the farthest south part of our district. But if you're not including the geographic south part of Santa Cruz County, you're, I want to ensure that we're having kind of truth in data um, and, and knowing where that line really is and what we consider South County is important because to Rachel's point, three supervisors will never ever appoint someone from the South County and even the fourth would be highly unlikely to if you're not including parts of say Aptos and La Selva or even Coralitas for example do we consider that South County because geographically Coralitas actually isn't that much farther south than Aptos. Um, it's just more inland. <laughs> um, and so it's I think it's important when we, we have that conversation. I, I, I just mentioned this not to negate the fact that we have a South County representation problem. Um, we need to get more people from South County appointed. Even, even if we include Aptos, we, we still probably have a problem with including people from South County, um, but we just need to be, speak truth in our data about what it means. Um, we, and I agree with Rachel, we need more renters, we need more people from diverse backgrounds. We, and part of that, and I, I think Mr. Dallas, you know this, which because I spoke to it earlier, is the fact that without equity in housing, equity and access to income, people cannot afford the time to be part of these commissions. Um, and that's, I think, what leads to a lot of, of the disparity in people who have the time, right? Truthfully, I think if we looked at our commissions, we have older people who are retired who can give their time. They're already economically stable enough and they have um, that access that um, other people don't. And so I think not only is it good that we're collecting this data, but it will lead to a conversation of what, how can we structure our commissions so that people can give the time? Um, does that mean varying day and evening meetings? Does that mean, uh, and, and what does that mean? And not just in terms of outreach, um, but I just, I'm a data purist, um, as you know, 
Uh, and so I do think it's important that we have consistency and not just self-reporting on what that means. Um, so I appreciate that we're having this conversation in, in terms of how to get bigger outreach. I, I know that we're now gonna start collecting it for the applicants um, so that we can have the conversation. And then once we get the data on who's applying, then we can have a conversation on who, um, how we structure these commissions so that people can participate. And I think some of the things these commissions are doing will, will make it so that people can. And I think the, com the planning commission's role uh, will be to create better equity so that people can live here and then participate more. I, I agree with well, that. Well, if, if I can say something, it's been brought up in my tenure as a planning commission. There's lots of people who have requested evening meetings, but it was always suggested that keeping the county, county building open or is a big problem and it's asking employees to work at night, which none of them wanted to. So I think it's not like it's not been discussed. And then a lot of people who have kids just don't have the facility to make a regular meeting. I don't know, you know, certainly worth all these things are worth considering, but it isn't like no one thought of it before. They've always just never come to fruition for, because of you know costs and administrative issues, that's all. Thank you, Renee, because you brought up something I wanted, I forgot to mention that I, I actually thought of coming into this meeting, which is I think one of the things the county can do, and I think it's hard, but I think it's our responsibility is actually advocate for, and I know the planning commission's you know, going back to in person, but I think actually advocating for remote meetings for commissions, um, I think actually makes a huge difference for participation for people who are young and have transportation issues. I think it makes a big difference for people who have children and, and or, or any caregiving need, to be honest. I think it makes a big difference for people who do have to travel from South County for traffic reasons. Um, I, I think it makes a big difference. And so advocating for changes to the either Brown Act for commissions or remote access for commissions, um, I think actually makes a difference for people being, because I think access matters and people being able to serve and have flexibility. So I think the county continuing, when I talked about restructuring the commissions, that's actually one way the county can do that is to advocate for restructuring of the way these commissions meet. Um, because we saw even at the board of supervisors level that we had more participation when the board went remote than when they weren't. And so the commissions is the same way. And I think both in terms of people attending, but also serving. Um, and so to your question, Peter, how do we get more people to serve? Um, encouraging a, a, a different way we structure could be one of those ways. And that's the responsibility of us to advocate at the state level. And when I say us, I mean the county. Um, Mr. Reeve, you've had your hand up for a little bit. Did you wanna add something there? Just, just to put a finer point on what Commissioner Violante said, right? Is that come the end of February, the state emergency declaration ends, therefore all Brown Act controlled boards and commissions will be required to be in person or have a quorum in person. So to achieve what Commissioner Violante is mentioning, it really does have to be a state level change. Um, not that it isn't a, wor a worthy consideration, but just wanted to make sure that people understood that that is changing, that the board and all commissions will be required to have a quorum in person. Uh, starting in March. Understood. Well, um, may I add something? Yes, please. Um, I think that's a really interesting point of view. It would involve, you know, kind of systemic changes, um, as you just pointed out. I'm going to express a somewhat uh, different point of view. I, I think people on commissions knowing who each other is and meeting each other at some point in person or on a regular basis is still a good thing. You want to have collaborative meetings with your colleagues. You want to know who they are and where they are and so on. So uh, I think it's harder to be on a commission when other people are talking face. So I don't 100% agree. Um, so I just want to say that. And then I'm not sure that I, I don't, I'm, I'm a little nonplussed by the finding that to be a planner and work at the planning for many of certainly on the planning commission issues, you certainly generally need an associate or other professional qualification or a bachelor degree um, to get the job in the first place because these issues involve some, you know, basic levels of comprehension and ability. And um, is it a terrible thing that we have a lot of people that have a bachelor degree in our commission? I don't understand why that's such a thing to be overcome. I, I'm, I'm somewhat nonplussed by it. I think, uh, I think in this situation, right, it's, I think we need to think a little more broadly about all commissions and if 
advisory boards and, you know, um, in, you know, and just how do we, how do we do a better job, right? I mean, as we look at these next two questions, right? Like, you know, I understand that I think we would restructure how this question is, is, you know, why, why do you serve, right? You were appointed, but right. How do we encourage a more, how do we encourage others? What would, you know, drive them to want to be and serve on the planning commission or any other um, board within the county, right? I mean, well, maybe, you know, we're useful to have a list of commissions. I know our two members who work for supervisors are well aware of what we're talking about, but I know that there's a women's commission. I know there's a parks commission and a planning commission. There's probably 10 other ones I don't know about. So before I answer your questions, maybe how many commissions are there? Yeah, I mean, Renee, I think that that was kind of spoke to my first point. I think that you're asking for input from people who don't have enough information to provide that input. And and I think that when, you know, if the, this uh, presentation is going to be um, presented to other groups that that's critical information to have. And then also, this is really a board decision. It's not like how the county could do better. Board members are the ones who appoint commissioners. So this is really something, you know, that is the responsibility of the supervisors. And I know that in our office, we go to great efforts to find younger people, working people, um, people under the 40, um, people of color, women, which I actually think is missing from your report is data on how many on gender. Um, so I think that that should also be included. But in order to really provide input, um, people need to understand how commissions are appointed, who makes that appointment, it's board members, and then the geographic constraints of that board members are under and why that might skew data a certain way. And then once we have that information, we should look at the data again, kind of what Commissioner Violanti was saying is, um, I don't remember the phrase that she used, but like kind of truth and metrics. And, and then it would give us like a more clear picture of where our gaps are. And then that will tell us how we can better fill those gaps. And then it's really the board members who have to really do the work um, and their staff um, to go out and fill those holes to make sure that we have commissions that are more representative of our community. Well, um, I, I would agree. And I don't think that I'm unusual in that I know about four or five commissions, but Peter, but I don't know what, I don't have a basis to know what you're talking about when you say all our commissions are, they're 10, 20, and so on. And also, again, um, what's wrong with people having a certain level of, of ability and education to do some of these very important jobs? I, I don't understand why we should strive to have more people who have an equivalent of high school appointment and what's wrong with people? You have to have a bachelor's degree to get most jobs that involve thinking and writing and these jobs do. So I, I, I don't quite get that. But anyway, yes, what are the commissions uh, now that you're talking about? Is there a list? There is a list on the county's webpage. I think there's, I don't know off the top of my head, I think there's at least 50 to 75 of them. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I was going to say at least two dozen. Um, yeah. And then also they're complicated. Some are directly appointed by um, supervisors. That's the majority. There are some that are at large that are state mandated, like the Mental Health Commission, um, that have some direct appointments, some at large appointments. And so, again, like, um, you know, maybe we focus more on the at large appointments. But again, it's working. These are board appointments. So, it's really. These are uh, um, points that that really should be directed to the board because they're responsible for um, appointing these um, these commissioners. So, but yeah, I think we've given a, a lot of feedback on this. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we probably. I just had a couple follow up points. I think you know there's been a lot of good discussion. I think the equality in housing goes a long way towards solving this, which I know we're all passionate about. Um, and we're going to continue to make that a priority. But I would also add that, like, you know, probably beneficial to look at um, companies that focus on inclusive hiring. You know, we have a, my company in particular, you know, we strive for inclusive hiring and, and have a really good, um, uh, uh, I guess we, we have a very inclusive company, which is great. 
but I'll tell you like the biggest takeaway, like if I could put all of what that means into one little phrase is that inclusive hiring is not passive. It's active. It's finding the younger generation. It's training them. It's looking to where people um, would be interested in helping get, getting them involved even like before a commission. So like get them involved in what the commission talks about, like, um, you know, and, and then help train people up to get to positions that they may not be qualified for today. Um, and then I think a big part of this that can't be forgotten that the other commissioners have mentioned too is pay. You know, a lot of people can't take a day off on a Wednesday to come be in a meeting. And then they also probably can't, you know, for the majority of people, if we're talking about getting younger people involved, they have kids like someone mentioned. So like, let's, you know, let's look at that. If that's, you know, a serious thing that we want to do is like, let's pay people a wage for the day that they spend or help offset childcare costs. You know, I think there's a lot of ways that we could like adjust that. And that one change would probably get you so much more, uh, so many more applicants. Um, that's it. That's all I have. I'm really excited that this is happening and I appreciate the, that, that we're taking these steps as a community. I think it's really important. You know, thank you all for input on both these topics, right? I know this is unusual from your your day to day operations as as a commission, um, but I think your feedback is still important and noted, and um, I'll be sure and pass this along. So, um, but at this point, I would do want to turn it over to Dave Reed, um, the the director of the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience, to talk a little more about the Climate Action Plan. Good morning. Um... Commission, uh, Chair Gordon and staff. Um, thanks for the opportunity to give you all an update uh, on where we are in our climate action and adaptation plan. Um, wanted to just give the commission a high level overview of some of the elements that we've been working on and we'll be bringing to the board um, in December. So as part of the update to the 2013 climate action strategy, and the development of this 2022 Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. We did an updated greenhouse gas inventory. Um, 2019 was unfortunately the best available data pre-pandemic to give us a representative um, data set of typical use um, because of the issues with the pandemic, the 2020 and 2021 data was not used. So this original inventory was created by AMBAG and then modified by our consultant team. The main takeaway here that I just wanna share that most of you already know is that nearly 70% of our greenhouse gas emissions are from the transportation sector. And then nearly 25% is from our built environment, particularly the natural gas and propane elements. One highlight um, of significance is that we have a very, very low electricity carbon footprint um, because of the good work that this county did in supporting the creation of 3CE and their um, sustained work on reducing the carbon footprint of our electricity. So just wanted to highlight those two things on this inventory side. Next slide, please. This um, graph, there's a lot of numbers here, but I'm gonna try and just distill it down to a couple key points um, for the commission. Um, and something that has changed as of September. The 2030 reduction target, um, commonly affiliated with SB 32, um, which is the 40% below 1990 levels, um, that has been a state law for a number of years. And so what, we're, what we are showing here is a four, essentially four different lines. The dashed line at the top represents what our emissions inventory was in 1990. And that's a, you know holding that steady across the top there at a little north of 760,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. The red line represents what's called business as usual. If we didn't do anything, if we ignored state and federal guidelines, our emissions would follow that trajectory in the red. The orange line represents some of the existing state and federal um, fuel standard uh, requirements that are going to be coming online over the next few decades. And so it represents some of those actions being taken outside the county um, at the state and federal level to reduce emissions. 
Which line was that, Dave? I'm sorry. That's the orange. That's the orange line um, that says that's in the legend says state and federal actions. So the reason okay. I say that the reason I say that is is that when or the reason that line is important is that we do expect some emissions reduction efforts to come from those those state and federal legislative requirements. So then that adjusts kind of what we as a county have to do to reduce our emissions to meet the target of 2030. And then, and then more significantly, um, in September of this year, AB 1279 was passed, uh, and that codified the 2045 carbon neutrality target. So we do now have these two targets codified through legislative action at the state level. Um, the 2045 target had been just an executive order, um, but what we are doing in our cap is setting those two targets as our goal and as our requirement um, to meet those. And so what we need to do is, and what we are doing is trying to create a menu of mitigation strategies. So mitigation being the, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions to meet those two targets. Um, as an example, the city of Santa Cruz set in the city of Watsonville set intermediate aspirational targets to reach that carbon neutrality sooner. But to give folks a frame of reference, we, um, we need to reduce our CO2 emissions to meet the 2030 targets by essentially the emissions of the entire city of Watsonville. Um, the entire city of Watsonville's emissions is right around 180,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. So um, we are dealing with a much larger uh, target reduction that we need to meet. So we felt that it's a reasonable goal uh, and it's going to be a challenging goal to meet that 2030 and 2045 target. Um, can I ask you a question about the data you're using so I can understand what please. we're looking at? So when you're, so the yellow line, when you said this is taking into account state and federal actions. One important piece of that, as the previous slide showed, was transportation. So is the move to electric vehicles part of that? And then how um, was that uh, calculated? Like how, I mean, we have kind of a trajectory of, of people moving to EV. Um, I believe it's going to go much more rapidly in the next decade. And then 2030, you're not even going to be able to buy a gas powered vehicle in California anymore. So was that taken into account in the yellow line or, or not? My, um, so forgive me, I might not have all of the details, but it's a great question that I'll make sure to have when, when we are before the board and I can certainly follow up with you and the commission on it. Um, right now, the, I do not believe that the analysis includes the electrification, you know, the no new um, gas powered vehicles sold by 2035. I think it was 2035. Yeah, I can't um, remember something like that, yeah. Um, but it includes some of the carb fuel efficiency standards and then Title 24 um, residential building standard information okay. as well. So it's, those are the two primary data sets that, that, that support that reduction. And you can see it's, order of magnitude about 100,000 metric tons. So it's, a, it's, it's significant, but not a, a ton when you think about it over the, from 2022 to 2045, it's only 100,000. So it's, so it yeah. probably, it, it probably doesn't reflect that kind of faster paced um, vehicle electrification process that we hope to see. Yeah. And I think in our County, you know, we punch above our weight a lot of times and move faster than other places with, especially with environmental issues. Um, it would be great to kind of project that and take that into account because that could actually be really pretty meaningful in trying to reach our goals. Yeah, and, that's, and that, that will bring up, I think, on the next slide, unless there are other questions on this slide. Um, if there aren't, I think the next slide, Peter, does touch kind of a little bit on that intent, Rachel. And so one of the things, um, sorry, Commissioner Dan, um, one of the things that's unique. You also uh, call me Rachel. <laughs> one of the things that's unique about um, and different about our climate action and adaptation plan 
Um, we, we completed this or we are going to complete this on a much more accelerated schedule than the cities of Santa Cruz and Watsonville. And the reason we did that is that we want to try and sync up with our operational plan to, to have a two-year cycle where we're, we're evaluating implementation objectives, making sure, as Peter said in the operational plan, that those implementation objectives are smart or smarty objectives, um, and then pivoting and adjusting. We recognize that um, our strategies will be kind of longer vision, aspirational in nature, and then the objectives need to have a shorter life cycle, not only to evaluate their effectiveness um, and hopefully achieve them faster, but also because we know that state and federal legislation and funding opportunities are changing relatively quickly. And so there may be things that come online that we want to take advantage of and we want to adjust some of our operational objectives. But as I said, the key elements are really, we need, we need to meet those 2030 and 2045 objectives. In my opinion, um, my concern rather is that the state will start to look at how effective communities are at reaching those targets, not unlike they are at the RENA allocation and, and buildability level. And, and my fear is that they will start to take away local control um, if we're not making measurable actions. So I want to be, we want to be um, striving towards meeting those targets as quickly as possible. The other thing that we are going to be doing is, is diving a little bit deeper into the implementation in 2023 with more specific, deeper level um, analysis of the objectives and making sure that they're measurable and equitable. And the reason we're doing that in 2023 is to support the, the new board members. We didn't want to fully bake the cake um, before those two new board members had a chance to review those things. So we're going to try and sync that up with the operational plan um, support, uh, adoption and have some of those measurable objectives in place for the board to consider. And then the other big piece is really recognizing, you know, from what we learned from COVID-19, that climate change disproportionately impacts some of our lower income residents, renters, um, and other marginalized populations, and that we need to be considering um, the impacts of our strategies and objectives on all community members. Um, and so we, we will be using what we're calling um, the cap equity guardrails to evaluate our objectives to make sure that we're trying to mitigate those disproportionate impacts. Next slide. So this is a lot of words that just hi, just wanted to highlight the kind of six things on the left of the slide. Um, you know, we want to look at the at these objectives to make sure that they're improving health and safety. We're addressing the financial options, right? If we if we do existing building electrification ordinances, you know, it's estimated through some of the work of the city of Watsonville that it's around forty thousand dollars to electrify a home. So if we create that requirement, we want to make sure that we have ways to support those folks that that, that would be an economic burden to. Um, and obviously that would ideally come from state or federal funding to support that. We want to make sure that we align with social and cultural needs and values in our community, that we reduce the potential for displacement um, with our actions, that we continue to invest and engage with our community to make sure, as Peter said, and as the discussion um, unfolded, um, in the prior content, you know, that we are representative of the community and that we're hearing from their community, the uh, diverse community voices. And then we also want to recognize opportunities to build more local and accessible green jobs um, that support our community and, and how we can do that to both support the emissions mitigation efforts, um, the climate change adaptation efforts, um, and also create local jobs. Next slide. So this is not foreign to all of you, but it was interesting. Um, so I want to just highlight, you know, some of the conversation that we had uh, earlier in the, the presentation, right? We talked about reducing vehicle miles traveled through higher density, all electric urban housing. Um, the board will be hopefully adopting the first uh, electrification ordinance for the county next week, um, which will be for all new residential construction inside the urban services line. So the housing element obviously can help that, that effort, and that's the big initiative that all of you know about and, and we'll be working on, and you'll be hearing about after our presentation today from um, Matthew Sunt and, um, and Stephanie Hansen. 
Um, but obviously the housing element can support the things that uh, Chair Gordon mentioned around active transportation, multimodal corridors, um, you know, by building higher density in our urban environment, we can support those things that you mentioned. Um, and then, and then obviously uh, the building, as I said, the building electrification is coming next week. I do want to highlight one thing that is of, of particular interest to my office in the context of the housing element. And I think it's just to expand on what Commissioner Violante said. I think typically our conversations at the county level around the housing element and the RENA allocations have focused on the affordability requirements and building affordable housing, which is critical in our community. Um, you know, as we all know, we've got a, a, a deeply racially segregated and socioeconomically segregated and unaffordable community that we live in and through the housing and RENA construction Hopefully we, we seek to address that. But I also see the housing element in the, in the construction of RENA allocated housing as one of our best tools to affect um, meaningful change in the climate space. So I wanna build that uh, fluency with the community that the housing element and the rezoning of properties to build higher density, all afford, uh, you know, affordable all electric housing in our urban environment is really a climate change effort, not simply an affordability effort. It's both, um, but I think we so oftentimes as a community get stuck in um, the affordability or, or not in my neighborhood mentalities. And I think we can all agree that we are, we are experiencing climate change now. We are experiencing it through catastrophic winter storm events, catastrophic fires, poor air quality, intense heat events. It's here now and the the construction of higher density in our urban environment will help that. And it speaks to what Renee said in terms of resources, sorry, Commissioner Shepard mentioned in terms of resources, we do not wanna prioritize building in our rural environment. We wanna prioritize and optimize the construction of new homes in our urban environment to reduce those vehicle miles traveled, support multimodal and transit oriented development and address our active transportation plans. So with that, I'll stop and happy to answer other questions. Um, that was amazing. Great, great way to put that. You just really simplified like all the benefits of, you know, the housing plan and, and where we're going. So I really appreciated that. Um, I'll let any other commissioners add anything, questions or comments. I have a few, but I'll, I'll I don't mind waiting. Maybe, maybe not. Please go ahead and start, Chair Gordon. Okay. I just wanted to say that, you know, I appreciate this. I didn't know if we we're going to kind of talk about the similar, like kind of what can we do better, that kind of stuff. Um, but I would say that like, you know, the greenhouse gas emissions, like you mentioned, it, some of the ways that I see that are be like really beneficial is obviously building denser in, in corridors and nodes like we talked about. Um, it's amazing how many um, good effects housing um, density and planning you know, has on the uh, environment and community. Um, but I would say, you know, some other things, like I don't know what the plan is to get less people on the road. You know, that was a huge part of our greenhouse gas emissions. So like, you know, is there like a highway one bus line that can happen or like some bus lanes that are like, you know, instead of having two lanes on a road, have one that's just a bus lane and really like promote that or like remove a car lane and on two lane roads and put a full bike lane, like a whole lane that's just for bikes and that kind of stuff. Um, can we promote like the scooter and the bike share? I don't know if that's, you know, what that is happening in our county, if we're doing that or not. Um, I think yeah. there's a lot of ways. Yeah, go ahead, David. I was just gonna share. I mean, I think, I think um, director or, WCAO Machado um, can speak at length around the good things that we're doing along the SoCal corridor, as well as the Highway One corridor with bus on shoulder. Um, so I can I can let him chime in. I'll, yeah, I'll be real quick. So um, I'll I'll start with your last question, Chair. The uh, the bike share program um, for about a year now, maybe a little more than a year. We've been in 
and um, contract negotiations to to unveil that and get that out on the street. So we're actively working with that and it's taking a bit of time because we're coordinating with the city of Santa Cruz and city of Capitola because we're all one community and we want to make sure that we have the same bikes running across those borders. And so we're trying to uh, organize that now. We, we hope to have something in place. I think it's going to be in the springtime just to get ready for summer. Uh, with regard to Highway 1, uh, bus and shoulder, yes. Uh, the first phase is going to construction this spring. The next two phases, which get us out to um, to State Park, are fully, or no, the next phase is fully funded at State Park. And then the third phase down to Freedom, uh, we're pursuing a very large grant to fund that, which will give us bus on shoulder from Soquel Avenue all the way down to Freedom. That's going to be a huge game changer. Uh, and then, you know, the other Highway 1 component is that um, the CEQA document that RTC executed a couple few years ago included a future HOV lane on Highway 1. Now, that one's not going anywhere yet, but there's cer certainly potential for a HOV lane on Highway 1 to promote more rideshare. Uh, and then I guess lastly, Soquel Drive, as Dave mentioned, uh, the first phase, which is La Fonda to State Park, about five and a half miles, is going is out to bid now. And uh, we'll start construction in the spring, which will get us a uh, improved sidewalks, buffered bike lanes, uh, improved bike lanes, more bike lanes. And so we're making great strides forward. Um, so I, you know, there's more to talk about there, but I know, you know, yeah, uh, we could spend all day on it. So I'll stop with that. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I appreciate hearing that. I didn't know about a lot of those things. Ms. Hanson, you have your hand. Thank you, Chair Gordon. Good morning, commissioners. Um, just in response to Chair Gordon's question, I also wanted to uh, remind uh, everybody that the new access and mobility element in this in the sustainability update sets the stage for all kinds of good multimodal improvements. Looked at every major roadway, assigned it um, status in the layered network so that all modes of transportation could be accommodated. Um, and also sets the stage for locating housing um, along those transportation corridors. So I just I wanted to you know remind everybody that we've um, set that stage for the for the long term in terms of our policies. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Um, great. Thank you for that. I just had two other quick thoughts. Um, and you know I. I drive often, I have kids, I got to get them to school, you know, I have a work downtown. Um, but I would say that, you know, for me, it's still, it's, it's, I kind of have to at some times, but then other times I could totally get all the kids on bikes and get downtown. You know, I was going, it was day before Halloween or Halloween, whenever there's a big parade downtown and I had to get past Pacific. And there's a guy who walked by me probably like up by Whole Foods I was in my car, he walked by me, and then I was stuck at Pacific and he walked by me again. And so, you know, the active discouragement, I suppose, of driving would solve a lot of problems. It's too easy for me. And so maybe if it wasn't as easy, like on those days, I should have just walked. I would have got there just in the same amount of time, you know? So I don't know if we're there as a community yet, but I, I could see that being kind of the next phase of this. It's not just like helping people with ride share and that kind of stuff, but then, my guess is that within the few years, it's going to be also like active discouragement um, and or like electrified vehicles only, like that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, that might be a future thing. I know that's probably a really touchy, hot topic. So <laughs> um, the other thing I want to chat about is just like, as it relates to housing, electrified homes is going to be a big deal, right? As you mentioned, that solves a lot of problems. I think another challenge that we have a lot of our housing is, is older, right? And, and houses are leaky. Right. So the heat that we pump into all the homes just pumps right out the windows, goes right through the roof if they're not properly insulated. And, you know, now we have these like better um, building materials where we can really seal up buildings really nicely and, you know, better window systems where they don't leak as much. And so I would say, like, if there's easier ways than like whole home electrification is like a really good one, but then also you know, when somebody goes to do new siding on their house, maybe they use a better material that seals their building envelope or new roofing material, or, you know, maybe there's ways to help people get better windows, get rid of single pane windows where the, like, you might as well not have a window. Um, 
And so I think there's other like building systems to look at that um, could help in the long run. Um, that's it. Those are all my thoughts. So, yeah, it's a great it's a great point, um, Chair Gordon. And and one there's a statistic or a table in the housing element that I'm sure um, will be in there again this year around the age of our built housing infrastructure. And it is remarkable how much of it is 1970s or older. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a it's a significant percentage, um, yeah. and so home home health as well as home energy efficiency um, are compromised with older homes. You're yeah. absolutely right. Any other commissioners? And Mr. Reed, to that point, and I know that part of the federal funding that was coming through in the recent um, Inflation Reduction Act has to do with shoring up those homes. Is that to Commissioner Dan's point? Was that type of calculation included in that reduction, or is that yet to be included in the modeling? The, the opportunity for people to further insulate their homes to look for that leak reduction has that yet been included? Because uh, to Commissioner Gordon's point, yes, we have a lot of and indoors, we do have a lot of older homes, and but that opportunity was included in the Inflation Reduction Act. So has that calculation of the opportunity and promoting those programs, helping people apply for those programs, and then obviously take advantage of them, has that been included in the modeling or not yet? Not, not yet. It's a great point. Um, and so often we think about uh, climate change resilient housing upgrades in the context of home hardening with respect to wildfire um, risk. But I think the points that you're both making around, uh, you know, building envelope. Uh, improvement uh, is is a great one. Uh, I used to work for a company called Sustainable Spaces, and I would do blower door tests, and you know, basically value engineer the most cost effective ways to make you know homes more energy efficient. So I'm 100 percent on board, and and Ecology Action and 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 a couple other nonprofit organizations are in this space doing this work already, and I think obviously we want to try and do more of it for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those things that, especially I think for lower income people, they're not going to fully remodel their home to do, they're not going to tear down a house and rebuild it. So they're going to be in a pre 1970s home. And the, I think the burden in some ways is on those with, with the ability and the time and the resources to help those who don't have those things. Uh, to be to help them leverage those opportunities, and those opportunities exist now. Um, and I, I just, when we talk about equity, I think it's it's it's. Um, I hope to see us as a community help those who wouldn't be able to afford to do insulation upgrades on their own. Because right, because it's always the truth is the people who often go after those programs are the people who have the resources to do the upgrades on their own anyway. Um, and they do them because the opportunity is there and it's, it's, it gives them the, makes it more efficient cost effective wise. And really we want to see opportunities of people who would never be able to do it become um, to, to do it this way. And I just, I hope that we, we seek out as a community to people who, who didn't even know it existed or would never even have, have, have sought it. So I just, I'm glad to see in some ways it's, it wasn't included in the modeling because it means we can have an opportunity of reduction, to be honest. Um, so, okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just want to add as someone who has looked at some of those opportunities, you still have to, it, it's still a big outlay of cash, even with the federal subsidies and the paperwork is something you do need some kind of degree to fill out, I think. And you, this week, I looked at just topping up my insulation for my house and it was like $3,500, just add another six inches. All that stuff's really expensive and the county would do well to help people apply for what's out there, but it, it, it still takes a lot of cashola uh, to do a lot of that stuff. And I also usually wanna make my usual uh, presentation that I, the rural part of the county has a minimal bus system and a lot of people live in rural areas and they are still and probably will for a long way will be dependent on private vehicles because there's no other way to get around, especially when it starts to rain. Uh, you know, the street I live on, there's no bus service. Um, there was for a while, but it got cut out. So, I mean, I think 
keeping a lot of these programs in the urban services where they're practical and useful, like Tim is talking about, makes sense. And I hope that we will never get to this thing of applying it to all the county because we do have, the county is so diverse in its terrain and where people live and how they live. I think we have to be respectful of that and remember it. Yeah, I will. I, I will say that you know, building electrification isn't isn't being currently con for new for existing construction is not before the board. The board is just considering new residential construction at this time. Yeah, I I, I looked at into getting a heat pump. It's twenty thousand bucks. Okay, I can get eight back from the feds, but that's still twelve thousand dollars. You know, a lot of it. it yeah. I, and I think one of the ways in which we're looking at trying to address that is actually at a regional collaborative scale. So, so our office in is is trying to collaborate with the county of Monterey and San Benito, the city of Santa Cruz and Watsonville, um, to look at a regional climate approach in terms of seeking some of the funding to do some of this work, so that we are more competitive as a region to get the dollars in that we need. It's north of probably a billion dollars to just electrify every home in Santa Cruz County, um, not just the jurisdiction but um, of the unincorporated, but the whole county. So that is a staggering amount of money that we don't have. So we need those federal dollars and we feel like the most competitive way we can do that um, is being in a, in a regional collaboration. Um, so uh, great points by everybody for sure. I'll just make one real quick comment and um, kind of uh, springboarding off of my question earlier to Dave about um, the electrification of vehicles and that I think going forward with the cap that it's critical to make those projections about transportation since that is over almost 65% of our greenhouse gas emissions and that knowing that we're so rapidly moving towards electrification that taking that into account is important for the decisions we make going forward because you know, I don't know that, you know, in 15 years, um, cars are not really the enemy. We get our electricity from clean sources, um, and the majority of folks are driving electric vehicles by then, then uh, we really have to look at um, uh, cars and, and in a different way and look to other methods to reduce our impact. Absolutely. Mr. Reed, to this, I'm completely pivoting here, but in, in any of our reductions, does it include um, the reduction of like switching now that we do organics, um, waste diversion and any of that type of thing? Is that is that included in the modeling as well? Since that's something that we've obviously changed recently. And yeah, so, so the projections of, of um, changing the, the, um, the waste management system out in, in Buena Vista in the next few years, is that included in the modeling as well? Right now, what the modeling includes, um, and and one caveat that there's a there's a methodology that has been industry accepted, and in my opinion, sometimes it doesn't give the local level granularity that I would like to see. We wanted to get a refreshed baseline that was consistent in methodology with the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Watsonville, and so we stuck with most of those methodologies. The waste stream footprint is mostly just looking at the landfill rather than the transportation of waste to the landfill. But to expand a little bit on your question, I do think that there's a carbon sequestration opportunity with our organics stream. And I think as we eliminate the, the food waste from that organics stream um, or included in our organic stream, there will be, you know, there'll be other potential other opportunities. And I know that um, Deputy CAO Machado is, is looking at kind of the waste to energy stream. We're looking at things like pyrolysis and gasification as, as resources and then creating things like biochar. Um, and AMBAG, our Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, is doing uh, a, a study to look at natural agricultural and working lands um, from a carbon sequestration capacity standpoint. So I think we will need to expand the carbon sequestration capacity of our county um, on behalf of the cities who have very little capacity in that regard, but also just to meet those 2045 targets of net neutrality. So I think there's there's a lot there in the waste stream and a lot more work being done. Well, I think to Ms. Dan's point, I think transportation is becoming increasingly electric 
I mean, right, I there are big grid companies that are going electric, there are uh, forklift companies that are going electric, and so increasingly, not even just in passenger vehicles, but in the commercial sphere. So I'm, I'm, it's interesting to hear that that wasn't part of the modeling and that's something also that could change over time. Um, you know, and, and I agree with her that it, that I think, I, I hope, I should say maybe more than think that it'll be a rapid, I agree with her on the passenger vehicles, it'll be a rapid ad adoption, but I think even in the commercial sphere, it'll also be a, a, a rapid adoption as this technology we've seen quickly, um, quickly evolve. And then I think once it gets to a point where it's commercially accepted, that it will also be rapidly adopted. Um, so that, I mean, it's in, thank you for sharing that that component, not only in the waste stream, but also in the transportation component of that as well, because I agree with Ms. Dan that I think the electric vehicle um, adoption is coming in, in a multitude of the areas. So thank you for that. I think there's one hand from the public. If you want to, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, let's, um, let me, I had just one other quick question, then we should open public comment. Um, is there any thought of future for sustainability as a whole, um, as it relates to the built environment, um, any kind of like incentives for people to track or manage the carbon uh, imprint of their buildings and the buildings that we you know, create and or, you know, ability to help people understand even what that means, you know? Um, there is there is a tool that the city of Santa Cruz and currently the city of Watsonville are using around the individual consumption patterns and transportation patterns for folks. Our cap really did focus on the things that we have control over as a county. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that there is continued education opportunities for the public to understand both their purchasing patterns and the footprint of them, those as well as their transportation patterns, as well as their home. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that one of the initiatives that 3CE is working on in the building electrification space is education and outreach. And I think that there's maybe an opportunity there to start to educate folks that Shifting to all electric actually can be a utility cost savings over time um, because because the cost of electricity um, and the efficiency of heat pumps. Um, but I think we we need to be educating folks about that and then all the other opportunities that you mentioned, um, Chair. Yeah. Around. Great. Awesome. I think education is a big big part of it. So anything we can do to help will help uh, the community. Um, Great. Well, thank you all. Awesome discussion. Uh, I think on our on our um, study sessions here, we do have public comment typically. So let's um, let's move to that, Ms. Drake. If we could please open public comment for this, I'd appreciate it. Sure. All right. So if we could get three minutes on the timer. Um, every member of the public um, will have three min three minutes to comment and I ask that you state your name for the record when I call on you. And the first color that we have the hand raised is last four digits 2915. I believe that's Becky. Good morning again, please state your name for the record. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Thank you. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Um, before you start my clock, can you clarify for me, am I going to be able to comment on only the climate action and adaptation plan, or can I comment on other things um, that have been discussed earlier? Item seven. Sure. Anything discussed as part of item seven, you can comment on, I believe. Right, Chair? He's nodding. Yeah, please. Thank okay. you. Okay. Great, thank you. I will start with the most recent topic. Um, I, I am. I listened to this presentation um, at the Board of Supervisors meeting, and my concern is that we're using 2019 greenhouse gas emission data. Um, that was pre-COVID, but the fact is that transportation patterns have really changed, likely permanently, because of the now easily available remote access work from home option that many people have. So 
I think that needs to be really examined in all of this. Um, I also want to say, as a member of the public participating by telephone only, I can't see any of these slides you're seeing, and I would like to request that in advance of meetings like this in work sessions, the future that all slide presentations be posted on on the website. Um, thank you for that. Um, regarding the electrification, I support the cleaner technology, but is it really cleaner? And also, does our current county's infrastructure have the ability to support this vast increase in electrification? I have attended some of the 3CE um, meetings, and they are not 100% green. They're hoping to be, but they are not. And can our infrastructure, electrical grid, battery storage, is it really going to be able to handle this, um, this increase in electrification with vehicles and now I'm hearing homes, all new construction? Um, I'm happy to hear that it would not be required of rural homes because those of us who live in the rural areas know that we are subject to power outages prolonged sometimes in storms and with PG&E um, shutoff events. I also want to bring to your commission to have it in your mind that when you talk about older homes, you can often be addressing historic homes that should be preserved um, in their historic context and so we need to have some ability to help those property owners retrofit things to become more energy efficient. And to that effect, I would just really support this county in act, uh, enacting the Mills Act where property owners of historic structures can get um, property tax reductions for improvements that they do while maintaining the historic preservation of their properties. Um, I support the carbon sequestration, and I really think we need to be also looking at uh, refor urban reforesting rather than, um, I'm seeing a lot of large buildings being planned. The trees are very small. Um, the dense infill is going to require removing many trees. Thank you, An Becky. example of this is the Capitola Road development. Over 100 trees were cut down and not many are being planted. All right, thank you very much. Um, I have other comments in general regarding the Santa Cruz like me. Um, okay, great. So I'll write them. Thank you. All right, do we have any additional members of the public who wish to speak at this time? If so, please raise your hand by pressing star nine on your telephone or raising your hand using the hand icon on Zoom. Sorry about my lighting. <laughs> um, I am not seeing any chair. I will uh, turn it back over to you. Great, thank you. Then we can close the public comment portion of agenda item number seven and then um, bring it back to the commission for any further discussion or questions um, and then um, go from there. Any other commissioners have anything they'd like to discuss? Doesn't sound like it. Okay. Well, great. Thank you, Mr. Reed, Mr. Devlas, and everyone else who chimed in. Really appreciate it. Um, really clear and good discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. So we can close agenda item number seven, and then um, we're about close to two hours in. So I think it'd be a good opportunity to grab a 10 minute break. Um, that works for everybody. And then when we come back, maybe we can fall back to agenda item number five and six really quick and get those votes out of the way. And then... Great. Great. Um, yes. I, uh, I'm going to have to leave at, um, at noon. Just wanted to say that. Understood. Thank you. All right. So shall we reconvene at 1120? Um, yeah, and in that case, if Commissioner Shepard needs to leave at noon, can we just go straight into the arena presentation? Oh. And skip past our votes, what you mean? Yeah, take those at the end of the meeting so that Renee Shepard can hear as much of the housing element presentation as she can. 
I'm fine with it as long as we have enough people. I can't remember if we're all there. Just need three. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yep. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. See you all at 1120. All right, welcome back everyone. I think we'll wait till we see Ms. Drake and, and then move on. All right. Oh, 1122. Oh, good. Let's see, should we take a um, roll call really quick? Yes, please. All right. Make sure everybody's reconnected. So, uh, everybody's muted. Commissioner Violante, I see you are muted. Here. All right, Commissioner Dan. Here. Commissioner Shepard. I think I saw it on mute, but we missed your voice there, Commissioner Shepard. All right. Commissioner Shepard. <laughs> Whoops. Yes, I have to turn on three things and I only had two on. Sorry. All right. And Chair Gordon. Here. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, let's move on then. Uh, we're going to jump ahead to uh, agenda item number eight. This is a study session to review the sick housing cycle element update program. Yeah. Great. We, uh, we have Stephanie Hansen, Assistant Director, joining us this morning to kick us off. Good morning, Stephanie. Good morning, everyone. Stephanie Hansen, Assistant Director. Um, the CDI, um, we are very pleased to be here this morning to um, share our uh, proposed program for the housing element update. Um, as you know, I imagine the um, housing element update is required to be, or the housing elements required to be updated every eight years. Um, the state has aligned this with our recent RENA allocation, um, which we've discussed a few yes, yes. times. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think there's some background noise from you or Mr. Sun. Probably from that. Okay. You know, 
I'll take a walk down the hall. C continue, Stephanie. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, and so um, we have uh, created a program which includes um, lots of public participation and um, addresses the steps that are required um, to be addressed by HCD. And um, today, uh, Matthew is going to um, give you a presentation about the program and the schedule. Um, so I'm happy to introduce Matthew's son to you. I don't think you've met him yet. He is our newest policy planner, um, and he's been tasked with getting this program up and running. So with that, I will hand it over to Matthew. Thank you. Mr. Sun, you're, you're muted. muted. <laughs> Good morning, Chair and Commissioners. Matthew Sunt, uh, Planner 4 with the Community Development and Infrastructure Department and more specifically the Policy Group. And I'm here to present on the sixth cycle housing element update. <clears throat> general plan elements. This, this graphic lists the various general plan elements. The housing element is one of eight elements in the general plan and one of seven state mandated elements. It is updated every eight years. The fifth cycle housing element was approved by the Board of Supervisors and certified by the California Department of Housing and Community Development in 2016. Several of the elements shown on this slide will be updated in the upcoming sustainability update, which the board will review at the November meeting. Both the public, pu public safety element and the noise element were updated in recent amendments. And so updates of these and all the other elements are not part of the housing element update. This slide shows the fifth cycle housing elements, six cycle housing element goals that will be relevant to the sixth cycle housing element update. A sixth goal is added herein because it is paramount importance to the sixth cycle. And that's the one highlighted in orange. The goals include providing a range of housing choices, removing barriers to providing housing, preserving housing stock, and providing opportunities for special needs and supportive housing. Goal number two is to assist in the development of adequate housing to meet the needs of extremely low, very low, low and moderate income households. A new goal for the sixth cycle is to focus future housing in areas with high resources. However, the Department of the Housing and Community Development does not allow housing to be built in low resource areas. Only if the county will incorporate policies and programs that are designed to remedy existing poverty conditions in low resource areas. So the emphasis is put affordable housing in high resource areas, avoid the low resource areas, but there's a caveat. So the definition of high resources or high resource areas includes access to transit, schools, jobs, parks, and other services that do not require environmental mitigation and where permit streamlining or development incentives are available. Here on this graphic are required actions associated with the housing element update. First, the county must review its existing fifth cycle housing inventory. This will require that staff conduct a thorough analysis of the existing 1,000 plus properties included in the fifth cycle housing element. Properties that remain vacant may then be included in the sixth cycle housing element. On the other hand, properties that were developed during the fifth cycle will be evaluated by staff to determine if they are underdeveloped or underutilized, and therefore a candidate for inclusion in the sixth cycle housing element. Staff will also identify properties that were overlooked or subsequently subdivided and therefore not included in the fifth cycle housing element. 
but could be developed and therefore a candidate for the sixth housing cycle and the inventory of properties. Housing and Community Development Department requires that only sites with realistic demonstrated potential for development during the planning period be included. Our planning period is 2023 to 2031. The inventory must identify current utility infrastructure and must specify number of units and income level of units that can be accommodated on the property. Excuse me while I take a sip. <clears throat> As to site eligibility to accommodate affordable housing, county staff must review density of projects on similarly zoned sites at similar affordability levels as indicators of affordable housing potential. With some exception, vacant sites that were identified in two or more previous planning periods and, uh, and non-vacant sites identified in a previous planning period cannot be carried forward to the sixth cycle housing element unless the sites will be rezoned to allow 20% low income affordable housing or existing zoning allows by right development for 20% low income affordable housing. This will put constraints on how much capacity can be attributed to the existing inventory and may force the county to engage in rezoning to accommodate higher densities after the housing element is adopted. The Santa Cruz County RENA allocation. The, Monterey, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, or AMBAG, just approved the regional housing needs allocation or RENA plan for our region. The county was assigned ARENA number of 4,634 units in the eight year planning period. This slide shows a comparison between the fifth and the sixth cycle RENA numbers. Note that the RENA for sixth cycle has increased over three and a half times from the last cycle. As of 2021, 744 units have been permitted under the current RENA, which represents approximately 56% of the required units. So that's the period of 2015 to 2021. We built 744 units. This year will be a decent year for the county in terms of residential building permits. And so this percentage will be improved by the end of the current cycle. <clears throat> Affirmatively furthering fair housing or the AFFH means taking meaningful actions in addition to combating discrimination that overcome patterns of segregation and fosters inclusive communities free from barriers that restrict access to opportunity. This AFFH is new to the sixth cycle. Assessment of fair housing is imperative associated with affirmatively furthering fair housing. The state mandates an assessment of fair housing which requires an analysis of the relationship between available sites and areas of high or low resources and concrete policies and programs to affirmatively further the fair housing. The purpose of this assessment is to replace segregated living patterns with integrated and balanced living patterns and to transform racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty into the areas of opportunity. The assessment of fair housing includes a summary of fair housing issues in the jurisdiction and an assessment of the jurisdiction's fair housing enforcement and outreach capacity and an analysis and summary of fair housing issues using available federal, state, and local data and local knowledge. <clears throat> the analysis must include a variety of factors such as trends and patterns within the locality and in comparison to the broader region. This analysis must address integration and segregation, racially or ethnically concentrated areas of poverty, disparities in access to opportunity, including for persons with disabilities, and disproportionate housing needs, including displacement risk. Disproportionate housing may include overpayment, overcrowding, and housing conditions disproportionately affecting protected classes. <clears throat> Public involvement. 
as noted, public involvement has to be robust and begin to occur early in the process. Staff is putting together list of potential stakeholders who may have an interest in the development of housing in the county, including nonprofit housing developers, local developers, realtors, funders, farm labor organizations, community-based organizations, or organizations addressing homelessness or houselessness, and county departments. Staff will be using outreach methods developed for sustainability update, including an interactive website, public comment portal outreach via social media, publicized community meetings. It's relevant to note that the Board of Supervisors in their October meeting have uh, uh, requested a particular type of public engagement that reflects, uh, I would say, Santa Cruz like me, and we'll uh, address that uh, as we, as we uh, go through this process today. Sustainability update and climate action and adaption plan. <clears throat> It is important to note that the planning analysis that we are doing this year provides the foundation for the housing element update. Both the sustainability update and the climate action and adaptation plan contain policies and strategies that support infill housing, housing options for all in the context of a changing environment. Policy and code changes in the sustainability update that will be particularly useful as we figure out how to accommodate the sixth cycle RENA include the following, accommodating infill development along transportation corridors and in urban areas with services, broadening the range of densities allowed in our current zoning districts, creating new standards to facilitate smaller lots, raising the percentage of residential development that can be accommodated on mixed use sites, allowing slightly taller buildings and adjustments to floor area ratios that recognize the need for more housing, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> We've established a schedule and we hope to keep to it. We'll begin with assessing the housing inventory and seeing where the gaps are and then move on to the affirmatively furthering fair housing process that includes assessment of fair housing analysis. As noted in the staff report, staff intends to return to the board of supervisors with an update to engage our new supervisors in January. Environmental review is anticipated to be completed by June of 2023. We'll have stakeholder input beginning later this year, which will continue along with community meetings. We'll present a draft of the housing element to the Planning Commission, Housing Advisory Commission, and the Board of Supervisors next summer. First review by HCD, Housing and Community Development in Sacramento, takes 90 days. The second review will take 60 days by HCD. Certification is anticipated in March of 2024. The board also directed staff to apply for the pro housing designation offered by the Housing and Community Development Department in Sacramento, which improves the counties and housing developers chances of receiving funds from housing sources. After the housing element is adopted, the county would work to achieve the pro-housing element status and has three years to rezone properties needed to improve the housing inventory and accommodate the arena. <clears throat> and so with that, I conclude and open it up for discussion. Stephanie and I are available for answers. I can go first. Thank you. Sure. Unmute. Please go for it. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Matthew. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you. And so at the end there, you went over, um, I had a question about the timeline. And I think that you said that the county has until March 24 to meet this deadline. Is Was that correct? Did I catch that right? No, it's uh, March 24 is when the HCD will be um, certifying. So what that means uh, in, in the schedule, it would our schedule shows that we would be submitting to HCD our final adopted version adopted by the board in December of 2023. 
and then we <laughs> ship it to Sacramento, and they I anticipate a March certification. Okay, so the deadline is. So what is the deadline then? So the so we have. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight the the deadlines. The first deadline is getting the CEQA document completed by. Um, by June. Early summer, no. late late. No spring, no. April, what May. I'm asking though is yeah. not our internal deadline. What I'm asking is what is our deadline, so that we are not penalized by the state for not having a certified housing element. December 15, 2023 is the official date okay. established by HCD. Okay. And so what happens if the county is unable to meet that deadline? Uh, if we are putting in good faith effort to resolve all the issues that Sacramento requires, I think they're going to give us slack in terms of the timing. And I think our, our, uh, our staff is ready, willing, and able to address all the Sacramento requirements, and I don't anticipate uh, a, a delay. But for those agencies that are um, SCO flaws, for lack of a better term, and they're not working well with uh, Sacramento, the threat is, number one, that agency would be not on an eight-year housing element update cycle, Instead, they'd be on two four-year housing element update cycles. Uh, also, and I, I don't recall the uh, correct terminology, but it has to do with developer rights and the ability to, and Stephanie may uh, chime in on this one, yeah, developer that's rights. Build, builder's uh, remedy. Builder's remedy. Thank you very much. And that trans a, can you explain that for the public? I uh, yeah, it's basically a um, uh, developer can go into the community and build uh, based on what the code allows, uh, run through the process, permit process, but they still have to go through CEQA. Um, and if they do everything correctly, theoretically, the project is approved automatically. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So they're take so the state is taking decision making away from the local jurisdiction. Right, right. Um, and I believe that this is happening in some other jurisdictions right now in Santa Monica. That uh, it has. So yeah, appreciate that. Um, I, I would just say I think that um, we are on a tight timeline for the county. It's it's an enormous amount to accomplish in a little over a year. It and is. so um, I hope this data is is uh, flexible when we're showing due diligence because there are certain things out of our control yes. that happen in a decision-making process. Having been yes. through this um, before, it, it, there were parts of it that were um, contentious and take, took time. So yes. my first um, real substantive question is about um, SB9 and if that um, is going to be able to contribute to our arena numbers, if there's like going to be uh, an attempt to evaluate properties that have the potential of development under SB9 and SB9, right. can be taken into account with our arena numbers? Yes, we can account for SB9 units. We can account for ADU units. But the way that we would have to approach it, we'd have to take an example, our, our um, 2021 ADU units constructed and then forecast what might happen the following years through the 2031 timeline. So we can, uh, we can take that approach with the ADUs. As far as SB9, I think there may have been one example in 2021, Stephanie. I, I believe we just got our first um, SB9 application in. So um, maybe it's a delay, but there hasn't been the mad rush, you know, that people had feared. No. no, but the SB9 um, will be based on what we've previously gotten in. So it's not uh, kind of, a, it's more, a, we have to base it on what we actually A track record, in, which we don't have. We don't have a track record. We can't do an analysis of potential SB9 properties and say, oh, well, you know, these 3,000 properties could be subdivided and therefore provide housing. That's not... That you can't take it that way. Yeah, the state wants us to look at our track record. We have no track record, practically speaking, with SB9. It's my understanding we do have a good track record with accessory dwelling units. Sure. Uh, but we're in a economic period of, of uncertainty. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and I don't need to explain anything more than that, but um, we we have to account for that, that dead period, that down period of one year, two years, three years. Yeah. And then the ADUs count as medium, moderate, I mean? We typically divide them in our arena between um, low and, and moderate based on um, rents that we find on the market right. at the time. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then um, my last question was about um, the, this, the, this process in relation to the sustainability plan and the creation of the new RF zone district and the um, locations in the sustainability plan that are proposed to be zoned to RF and how much, so should those um, be approved by the board, um, how much of, approximately would that um, a, a account for, for our getting to our meeting arena? Like how many units have we done that calculation? We have done that calculation based on kind of the low range and the high range. I believe it was between about 200 and 400 units. Okay. And and so those would apply to the six cycle arena. Mm -hmm. And then, so, and then there will be a process for identifying other um, opportunity sites for- Yes. Reasons. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Dan, I want to commend you on your questions. Very succinct to the point and, and uh, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I want to emphasize that the state wants the local jurisdictions to exclude properties that were in the fourth cycle and fifth cycle. They were vacant for, for the, those many years. The state's approach is that well, if you can't build on that property in the, during the fourth cycle and the fifth cycle, which is a combination of about 15 years, 12 to 15 years, there's no chance of that property being developed in the sixth cycle. But with a caveat that we can carry that forward anyway, that lot forward into the sixth cycle, as long as we have a um, requirement that development on that property include 20% affordable housing. Okay. Okay, well, that's significant then. Yeah. Okay. And, and also the, the sixth cycle analysis, the workload associated with sixth cycle update is uh, substantially increased from the fifth. The details and the, and, the, and the way we have to analyze everything is completely different from what we experienced during the fifth cycle. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Dan. Any other commissioners like to ask some questions? I can go, I have a couple. Um, first off, thank you for the detailed explanation, Matthew, appreciate it. It's, um, I know this is a huge process and so the detail is really helpful and I uh, appreciate that. So I had a couple general questions about like some ideas around what maybe the county's considering and, and just trying to get a handle on maybe what the process will be. Um, and they're kind of not in any order. So I'll just start at the top. You know, I'm, I was, right now affordable housing is kind of like by the applicant, right? We don't have a requirement for affordable housing on a rental project, I don't believe. And so when we, you know, went through the sustainability plan update, the idea is really like, let's use the density bonus to get that affordable housing. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering how that correlates to the idea that of the AFFH, I think is really, a, I'm not sure if that's the right term to use in this scenario, but the idea that like, we're trying to place affordable housing in equitable areas. Um, how do you, if we're not saying affordable housing goes in a certain place, like this site that's like close to grocery stores and close to transit and, you know, it's like kind of by applicant to put it where they feel makes financial sense, I suppose. How do we marry those two ideas? Well, Stephanie, I could, yeah. yeah, I could help with that. Um, uh, first of all, Chair, we have to um, create an inventory of the properties that we are relying on to meet our arena. And um, 
and that inventory has to categorize them in terms of low, moderate, um, very low, and so forth. Um, so there's a you know a big uh, GIS exercise that needs to go on in the background in order to locate those properties, um, uh, particularly properties that are in high resource areas, um, and to zone them appropriately uh, for high density or in our case, residential flex. So you're looking at bigger properties, higher zones, and um, located in our higher resource areas. And, and you need to have an inventory that we may not show all of it by parcel number, but there's all the background data that goes into that. Um, so that's our job in terms of providing appropriate sites for affordable housing. Okay, got it. So really the idea is like, as you increase density in these high resource areas, you're also naturally increasing the amount of affordable housing. Uh, that's yep. the goal, right? I think um, HCD looks at 20 units per acre as kind of a base density for affordable housing. Um, and they'll be, they'll have access to our inventory right. and we'll be able to say which properties are which and, and where they're, where they're located. Yes. Yes, affordability by design. The higher the density, theoretically, the uh, more affordability. Yeah. Okay. Understood. Um, I, I wonder. There's some some um, mention in the packet about a potentially like updated um, density bonus, and I was just wondering if that was something like you know, thinking through how this is applied, if maybe there was opportunity for like a higher density bonus in areas that we wanted more affordable housing and, you know, as opposed to just the state mandated density bonus. And I didn't know if that was something that was being considered or. We haven't, we haven't gotten that far for that consideration. You know, mm -hmm. the state provides for a hundred percent density bonus. Um, for a long time, though, I will say that our ordinance exceeded the state's mm -hmm. uh, requirements. So that is indeed a poss possibility. Yeah. Um, great. Um, two more kind of general thoughts here. One is about transportation. There is so much about housing, especially with, from the state position that relates to high quality um, transit corridors, low BMT areas, major transit stops. And that's been a consistent challenge in our county um, to qualify for those. And I believe that there might be some change on that in the near future, but I'm just kind of wondering if the transportation part, like making sure we have those high quality transit corridors and the major transit stops is part of the solution in our housing element as, you know, like there's a lot of state bills that would allow you to do a hundred percent affordable project that could make more financial sense around a major transit stop. Um, but if we don't have any, we can't do those. Chair, Chair Gordon, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I'm leaving now, so I thought of it. Oh, sure. Oh, Thank I'm, you. Renee, did you want to add anything quick before you needed to take off? I apologize. If oh, I, I just want to play. I want to play my broken record one for 30 seconds to say yeah. that um, these inc vastly increased VENA numbers paying no attention if the infrastructure or resources there to support them seems highly irresponsible and part of the state. And I think at a certain point is going to get a certain amount of real feedback from voters who, who are have no idea what's coming. And it seems like they just lay out the state and say, you'll get this many and you'll get that many. And I, I, I don't kind of understand if we continue to have a serious drought, where are all the water's going to come from? And maybe it's there, but at least ought to be considered. And if it someday takes an hour and a half to get to Aptos instead of an hour, is that something most people are going to be fine with? And we all don't talk about that, but I think it ought to be talked about, just like Tim is saying about, well, if we had a, do we have well enough uh, developed transit centers to support you know, all these new housing. And I think we have, I think it's only responsible to provide for people to live comfortably. And if we're going to have a lot more housing, fine, but we need to have the infrastructure and resources to support it. And the, obviously the state doesn't, says that is not our affair. We just tell you how much housing you need. Uh, to, and I think that's going to work in at some point. So anyway, I always say this, 
but I really feel it strongly. And I think like a lot of voters are going to feel it strongly when they get told what these plans are, because I don't think most people know about this because it's hard to find out. Most people have no idea what's going on in Sacramento and very little idea what's going on in their own backyard these days, unfortunately, or not fortunately, as the case may be. Um, but thank you for allowing me my I get 45 seconds in, but I'll say we'll now get off it. And uh, sorry, I have to go get dental surgery today. Bye. Oh, well, good luck. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, Chair? Yes. Uh, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Garden's comments. And what I'd like to add is the state is requiring the county <clears throat> to uh, not be a hindrance, not to constrain, and to create an environment where 4,634 units can be constructed. Whether or not those units are constructed is a whole different matter, uh, but we have to lay the groundwork to accommodate them. If there's water, great. If there's sewage capacity, outstanding. If, it's, if there's no water and if there's no sewage capacity, then that's obvious that some units, many units perhaps, can't be constructed until water and sewer capacity is constructed. Now, how the state's going to respond to a jurisdiction that's uh, not providing additional water or not providing additional capacity when perhaps they can, we'll find out in eight years, 10 years, 15, 20 years. <clears throat> Understood. Okay. Thank you. Um, interesting. So is this housing element cycle kind of relating to my other question about transportation also, is this housing element cycle only a planning level um, like activity, or is it also kind of incorporating the transportation and the other things like we talked about in the sustainability plan? Well, it's part of the general plan, right? And yeah. um, uh, both your built environment element and the access mobility element address, as I mentioned before, address the um, the connection between land use and particularly housing and transportation corridors. Mm -hmm. So those remain intact. The um, the housing element is particularly focused on on housing, um, and is you know one piece of the general plan. Gotcha. So those don't don't go away. They're still at play. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, I think um, you know my thought is that the high quality transit corridors, low BMT, and uh, major transit stops do offer. If we have those, there's a ability to do 100% affordable housing in a um, form-based density approach, which could up the numbers that would be allowed in those major uh, corridor areas. And so I don't know if you are considering that that would be an important part to get really pushed through so that we could actually account for more uh, possible units in our affordable housing process. Well, we don't have a form-based code, yeah. and you've uh, planning commission just recommended updates to the code in the uh, sustainability update. You mm -hmm. certainly must recall. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> extreme that's state, discussions. Uh, sorry, that's a state density bonus that allows for that. Right. So that's it's right. not a local thing, but uh, right, right. So concessions and waivers are a possibility if uh, somebody is utilizing a density bonus providing affordable units and, and getting additional density for it. Um, okay, great. So let's see. Um, does any of this housing element deal with process, like county process? I know we talked about that a little bit, Peter, in the last presentation, but just generally thinking like the process is not just the planning level, you know, it's all the way through to the building completion. And so does this account for how do we make that better, faster, easier, all those things, or is this strictly like for zoning for 4,600 units? It's a policy document um, and has programs just like the rest of the general plan. Um, certainly um, programs should encourage streamlining uh, where at all possible. Um, uh, so I think it would be addressed in the housing element. And um, as, as Matthew alluded to in the presentation, part of our 
job is to get, you know, set the stage and then get out of the way so that projects can can move forward in an expedited manner. Um, there's one element here that um, we addressed kind of at the very end, but it is uh, the board has directed that that we apply for pro housing designation. Um, and as we're doing our housing element, assess our programs um, for any uh, gaps or needed um, programs in order to gain that pro housing designation. That designation helps us um, achieve higher scores in uh, competitive grants. Um, and so that once we get the housing element up, our intent is to, we know where the gaps are, our intent is to try to address them at the policy level in the housing element update, make any needed changes, and then try to attain that pro-housing um, designation. So that, that does become part of implementation and a lot of those programs are really aimed at um, streamlining and, and opening the doors where it might not be, they might not be open at this time. Okay, great, thank you. That answers my questions. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, Commissioner Violante, did you have anything you'd like to add? Just, just a few comments. I was giving Commissioner Shepard a chance since I knew she had to leave at noon. Um, but thank you, Mr. Sun, for your presentation. I know this is gonna be a, a huge lift for the planning department, as Commissioner Dan mentioned. Um, I know it says to 2024, but really it's a very short timeline to get everything done and to have it submitted by the end of 2023. Um, and to Commissioner Shepard's point, I think that the public, I think there's been talk and the county has done a lot of effort to kind of talk about the fact that the arena numbers are much, much larger than we've seen in the past and what that's going to mean for the community. And this commission and this body has done a lot of work in order to through the sustainability update, and it's now we're going to go before the board in order to make it, um, I don't say easier, but a little more streamlined, or to put the the tools in place so that housing can actually get built. Um, and yet, I still think that the public um, is going to be surprised, quite honestly, throughout the process of what that really means in order to build that housing. And so, um, I don't doubt that the planning department will do a good job of doing that outreach. I just think that it's one of those things where the it's always the burden is always on us to just try um, even more to keep the public informed. And I know you guys will do a good job. Um, I know you guys did a wonderful job, huge heavy lift when it came to the sustainability update um, as we move forward on this. And so I just want to thank you for your presentation. I know that this will be a lot of work on the back end. I don't have any questions at this time, um, just since this is just kind of a beginning steps of what is going to be a lot of work. I know not only your team, but I know GIS, uh, who's not here today, but they do a lot of effort when it comes to these things. and. Um, Mr. Price and his team are, are a wonderful asset for the county um, as you guys move your work forward. So that's all I yes. have to say. So thank you both. Yes. I have been engaged with uh, Mr. Price and the uh, GIS team already to get some uh, background information on, on our fourth cycle and our fifth cycle. Um, and I say fourth cycle, and fifth cycle because the uh, state says uh, in the two previous cycles a vacant lot is a red flag so our numbers right now and i'm not finished with it our numbers right now indicate uh, 458 lots in 2015 inventory were vacant in the fourth cycle as well yeah the last two cycles as i'm sure you know were were difficult to move through two different types of recessions um, with right. really, and then the pandemic. And so I mean, we saw construction projects begin and end. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, it'll be a challenge. I mean, it's interesting to hear uh, the fact that if they were vacant, we can only count them with the 20% affordable. So um, I look forward to seeing what comes yeah, um, and, of the work you guys are doing. And, and through this process with GIS, they've identified the fourth and fifth cycle vacant lots, but now we have to identify those vacant lots in uh, in the fifth cycle, how many of those have been developed since 2015? So I'm anticipating that 458 number is gonna drop, which is good news. Yeah. Houses were built. <clears throat> Great, well, um, then if 
if ever all the commissioners are done questions, we can open uh, public comment at this time. Um, Ms. Drake, are you here? I am. Hi. <laughs> can you help us uh, start public comment portion of this? Sure. Yeah, All right. So I will. Uh, I will remind attendees to either raise your hand by pressing star nine on your telephone, or um, raising your hand using the hand icon on your Zoom link. And I see a hand raised. Looks like it's Becky. Um, if we can get three minutes on the clock, I will call on caller two nine one five. Good afternoon, I guess, um, at this point. Um, please state your name for the record. You have three minutes. Hello, thank you. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, I would like to welcome and thank Mr. Sunt for his report and his very good presentation this morning. Thank you. And I also want to commend Commissioner Shepard for again bringing to the forefront these numbers are all well and good, but if we don't have the infrastructure, <clears throat> excuse me, to support them, how can we have a livable community? So, in fact, this very thing came up at the um, Santa Cruz City Water Council or Water Commission Monday night when they prepared to go to the City Council. Uh, that will be November 29th to present what Santa Cruz City plans to do to provide water for the area and they actually suggested that there be a presentation to you. So I hope that they do come and that staff will reach out to the Santa Cruz City Water um, Department. Also, we, we have not talked much about the sewage. Um, I know that Live Oak often gets targeted for a lot of this um, dense infill. What I am seeing is that most of what the county is proposing in the general plan uh, rezoning is in Pleasure Point. But in the Rodeo Gulch Basin, there is a sewer moratorium currently. How can we address that issue with these numbers coming in and accommodate the very large Kaiser Medical Facility that is also probably going to go in there? We also need to um, consider when we talk about putting the dense infill along transportation corridors, we must include the rail corridor because there will be and must be something to use that valuable corridor for some sort of public transportation. So I hope that that will also be considered. I would like to point out to your commission that recently at a County Board of Supervisor meeting, tiny homes on wheels will be allowed to be counted in the arena numbers. And that's a complex issue because they are on wheels and they could move. But um, the, your, your commission also needs to be made aware of that. And I hope Mr. Sons will talk about that a bit. As um, the also the rather novel way that the board suggested these changes be made to further public outreach by using something that I've heard called a wisdom council, but it's a, a random group of people that get together and they come up with solutions and public outreach methods. Um, regarding public outreach, I think the most effective is something very physical that people see. To that end, I request again that this county adopt a flagging and staking ordinance, similar to what Monterey County has done that is uh, required when an application is first um, con considered. My final, I think my final question is um, affordable by design usually means very small units. What will we do for the families? How will we give, provide affordable housing for families? That's um, not gonna work in a 400 square foot home. That Thank you, is Becky. affordable by design. And my final question is, will the unmet uh, RENA numbers in the housing element from Un, unbuilt units be rolled over to be added on to the six, year, six cycle numbers. And thank you again, Mr. Sun. I really um, appreciate your, your good presentation and your good staff report available for the public today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And do we have any additional members of the public who wish to speak at this time? Um, if so, please raise your hand. 
I am not seeing any chairs, so I will turn it back over to you. Great, thank you. Then we can close the public comment portion of agenda item number eight and bring it back to any commissioners have any other further discussion on this item before we close it out and move on to our previous items that we moved past. Nothing, Commissioner Danfield. Okay, great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Hansen and Mr. Sunt. Appreciate the uh, the great discussion and and uh, presentation. Looking forward to seeing this move forward. Um, <clears throat> cool. With that, we can close agenda item number eight. We're going to bounce back up to number five: con consent agenda items. Um, again, AB three sixty one is the only thing on the consent agenda. Uh, and I believe we had a motion and a second already, so we could just move to a vote. Please, Ms. Drake. Okay. Um, Commissioner Shepard is gone. Commissioner Dan? Yes. And Commissioner Violante? Yes. And Chair Gordon? Yes. Great, thank you, that passes. And then we can move on to schedule item number six, approval of minutes of September 28th, 2022 planning commission meeting. Um, would a commissioner like to make a motion on that? I'll move approval. Thank you. And, okay. and a second. Thank you, Commissioner Violante. And Dan, Ms. Drake, can we do a vote on this also, please? Okay, Commissioner Violante? Yes. And Commissioner Dan? Yes. And Chair Gordon. Yes. Great, thank you. That motion passes and we can close that item, move on to agenda number nine, planning director's report. Do we have a report today, Mr. Machado? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, no real report, just to let the commission know that we are planning to go to the Board of Supervisors next Tuesday uh, to start the process of final review and hopefully approval of the sustainability update and all its associated amendments and CEQA documents. So letting you know we're on schedule there and we hope to have it wrapped up by the end of December. So that's all I wanted to report today. Thank you. Yes, awesome. Uh, good luck. I know it's been a long, long uh, path to get here. So hope it goes well. Um, great, so then we can close that, move on to agenda item number 10, report on upcoming meeting dates and agendas. Do we have any uh, report on those, Ms. Drake? Um, yes, so we will not be having a meeting on November 23rd. Um, and so um, the next regularly scheduled meeting date is December uh, 14. And I wanted to check in with the Planning Commission because we actually have a rather large um, agenda that might be shaping up for that, that hearing date. Um, and I probably will follow up with an email poll once I have all of the agenda items nailed down, but we may, um, I may be checking in with you to see if you would prefer to do one very long meeting, probably an all day meeting, or if you'd like to look at scheduling a special meeting date um, to, um, to take care of some of the items. The next meeting after the December 14th meeting is December 28th. Um, it's possible we, if we have a quorum on the 28th, we could push a couple of items to the 28th. Um, but I just wanted to get that on your radar. We are firming up that agenda now and I'll reach out to the planning commission when I have a better idea, but I just wanted to get the wheels turning on that. It's um, always a challenge when we have a lot of projects ready for hearing in December, which is what's happening, um, which is unusual. Is it a large volume of projects or one or um, particular big It's um, the medical office building project is looking like it may make that agenda date, which I think is gonna be a very long meeting item. And then we actually have four other projects that are also, um, scheduled for that meeting date already. Um, and that includes a, a land division, complicated um, rezone, lot line adjustment, and um, at least one other item um, that is a, a coastal permit. So 
hard for me to totally gauge how how long each one of those hearing items would take. I would say probably half hour to 45 minutes for those three or four items and then plus the medical office building. So I think we could get it done in a day, um, hopefully. Um, but I wanted to just um, check in with you all about that. And maybe I'll follow up by email. I haven't had a lot of success with reaching out by email. I'll just say, you know, if I email, um, email you all with some questions, just get back to us so that we can get the agenda sorted out. So that's 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 December. And then in January, we're planning on coming back to the chambers. Um, and I was listening to the discussion earlier. I just wanted to, to just reiterate that we are planning on bringing back if we can, or introducing, I guess, um, a call-in feature for members of the public. Um, and um, that should hopefully um, help us um, with public participation in the meetings to have that option of not having to come down to the chambers um, starting next year. But we are, um, our goal is to have all of the commissioners in the chambers for the meeting. So not a hybrid, you know, quorum, but everyone, everyone from staff and from the planning commission in the chambers and then have the call-in feature or you know, in-person feature for the members of the public. That's what we're putting together right now for the January um, and beyond timeframe. And hopefully COVID um, is not an issue. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay. Well, on schedule really quick, I will look for email and try to respond right away. Apologies if I am not the fastest on emails. Um, and I, my initial vote would be for a longer day. I may or may not be around on the 28th. I got to double check my schedule, but okay. usually that week out. Um, so that would, that's just my gut reaction. I can check in the morning. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure staff would prefer to not um, have a meeting on the 28th. We definitely cannot do the medical office building on that date. It would be the other items, um, which would be hard to coordinate multiple items on a different date um, with with staff being that week. Um, okay. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Then last item on the agenda is county council's report. Do we have a report today? Justin. Probably not. Yeah. Sounds like not. I see Justin is on, but um, <clears throat> I'm guessing he does not have a report. Yeah. Okay. If he does, Sorry, no oh. report. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate that. Um, with that, we can conclude the hearing today and looking forward to seeing everyone on the uh, 14th. Thank you very much, everyone. Cool. All right. See ya.